Story 1. I moved into a four-bedroom university house. I knew two of my housemates, let's call them Abby and Ben. Due to unfortunate circumstances, our previously planned housemate didn't live with us, so we found a new one, Chloe. Chloe turned out to be a terrible housemate. This became apparent when she never paid any bills or rent on time, smoked heavily inside against our agreement left home for a few days leaving a big pile of washing up for us to do including our pots and pans, and screamed while gaming on her laptop until five and the walls are thin. These are just a few examples of her inconsiderate behavior. Basically, she was incredibly difficult to live with. About four months in, we could no longer stand Chloe, so we had a house meeting. We sat there and tried to explain how we would prefer she didn't scream at her laptop, presumably while gaming until 5 am every night, as all of us get up early. Chloe denied everything we brought up. We had each lent Chloe a month's rent and bills, and she hadn't paid any of us back over a thousand pounds between us. Chloe denied this, saying, I don't owe you. At this point, Abby, Ben, and I were all quite upset. A few weeks later, on a Saturday night, being students, Abby, Ben, and I invited friends round for pre-drinks. We asked Chloe first. She said she would be out, so that was fine. It turns out Chloe finished work early and came home, shocked to find people there. She went up to her room, but kept coming down and turning the music down, even though it wasn't even loud in the first place. Chloe became so angry that she threw my speaker out the window. I didn't see Chloe do it, but many people told me so. I'd had enough, so I went to retrieve my speaker. Chloe came with me, to my surprise. As Chloe left, in full view of me, she keyed my car parked on the driveway. I picked up my speaker and started shouting as she walked off. Fortunately, we have an automatic light on the side of the house, and a car was driving down my road at the time. The driver said they had a dashboard camera and probably caught the incident out the window. I stopped shouting in disbelief and gave him my email address. I then went about my night enjoying the party. When it was time to leave, many of us hadn't finished our beverages, so we left them on the kitchen table and departed. When we returned the next day and had sobered up in the morning, we found all the beverages had been taken, along with the speaker, some headphones, and my laptop. Now I was really upset. The revenge. I logged into my housemate's laptop to check my email. The driver had come through, sending me a small clip of Chloe keying the car along with several close-up stills showing the key in contact with the vehicle. I first confronted Chloe, asking if she knew where my belongings were while Abby and Ben secretly recorded on their phones. Things got heated, and it looked like Chloe was going to fight me. I'm a tall guy 6'4", and wasn't intimidated. I was essentially just aggravating Chloe. She then swung her fist at me a few times, making contact. I didn't fight back. I put my hands and arms over my head and face. Chloe then stomped off, thinking she had won. Let me remind you, Abby and Ben were recording. I called the police, they showed up, and I explained that I had good reason to believe Chloe stole my beverages and other possessions. They went up and knocked on Chloe's door. Go away, she said. They couldn't enter without a search warrant. I filed a report about assault and the stolen items, relating the two incidents. The police were very helpful and basically guided me on how to fill it in. They returned the next day with a warrant for Chloe's arrest for assault and battery. They then searched her room and found all the stolen beverage bottles, my headphones which clearly were mine as they only paired with my phone, my laptop, and the damaged speaker. I sued Chloe and won. I had indisputable evidence along with witnesses for all the events. I was awarded approximately £3,000 for the car damage, speaker, and rent Chloe owed us, plus an additional £5,000. Chloe went to prison for resisting arrest, assaulting a police officer, assault, destruction of property, theft, and battery. Chloe still had to pay rent for her room, which we used as a gym. Edit. I changed they to Chloe as I tried to use correct pronouns, but it clearly just confused people. Also, to those asking why I bothered, repairing my car was going to cost over £1,000.
My speaker was decent around 250 pounds new. Headphones were about pound 300, and the laptop I study computer science was approximately 1,600 pounds new. The beverages were left after a party with about 20 people, so I estimate there was over pound 100 worth left. I got the laptop and headphones back undamaged. Edit 2. People seem to care more about whether it's a legitimate story than if they actually enjoyed reading it. I didn't post this to be quizzed on every little detail. I skipped what I thought was irrelevant, or else it would be a novel. My story is factual, as I'm sure many stories on here are, but I will not be posting any videos or photos that might compromise anyone's identity in the story. I hope people can respect this. Story 2 My ex and I were in our late 20s, this was two years ago. We lived in a pretty high-end apartment, and all our bills equaled $2,500 a month. Edit, I know this seems low for high-end, it's not a major city, and it's not really a wealthy area. In our second year together, he became depressed. I had started a business before we met, and I was beginning to bring home about $5,000 per month. I decided I could cover everything while he took a few months off work so he could get himself together. He was a teacher, and he was always stressed. However, he spent all that time playing video games. The apartment would smell unpleasant. He wouldn't shower. There were energy drinks everywhere. I ran all the errands. I even paid for him to go to therapy since he didn't have insurance anymore. I'm not sure if he actually went but he came back after two sessions and said his therapist doesn't see anything wrong with him, so there's no reason to keep going. I encouraged him to get formally diagnosed with something and maybe get on medication. He was told he may have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but he never got any tests or anything. He just said, they think I have ADHD and went back to his games. He also never did chores, and if I nagged him, he flipped out on me a few times because he died in the game. The apartment got messier. I grew tired of his presence. Six months later, I told him he needed a job. He broke down crying and said he couldn't because his depression was so bad. He couldn't function, more tears. He's also the only boy in his family and the youngest, and according to his sister's stories, his parents would give him whatever he wanted if he cried. Eight months in, he still didn't have a job and wouldn't get help. I was fed up. I went into his phone to snoop and found on Discord. He was telling gaming friends he's some big shot day trader, I'm his annoying girlfriend who does nothing all day, and he has to take care of me, which he does through playing the market. He says he feels guilty for leaving me because I have a lot of issues. He was also using fake pictures to engage in inappropriate conversations with girls in games he plays. It wasn't even him in those pictures. A few days later, I told him that he needed to get a job. Crying started again. I told him I understood, but it had been months, and my business was no longer doing well. I couldn't make next month's rent. In fact, I would likely call my sister and stay with her for a bit since my business was online, and I could work from anywhere. He had nowhere to go. His only family was across the country. He moved here to finish school and he had no money to move back. His parents had passed, and all of his siblings didn't have room for him. His credit was also poor, and he had no current employment, so he couldn't get a place himself. He started to yell at me, asking me why I didn't tell him sooner. He would have looked harder for a job. It took him all of two weeks to secure two jobs, another teaching job and a graveyard shift at a gas station. He ended up begging me to renew the lease with him since he couldn't get his own place. I did. He was never home now. He worked all day at school, slept or graded papers when he was home, and worked at the gas station. I stopped cooking for him, and I would only do my own laundry. He would also keep asking how my business was doing, and I told him not well, I'm struggling, and I'd bring up moving in with my sister again. He asked me to try harder or get a regular job and if I brought up moving out, he would drop it. I appreciated that he worked two jobs and was never around two. I didn't even have to be intimate with him, rather, say I have a headache. So he ended up paying for everything, which I consider paying me back for all the expenses I covered. 
I went on dates during that time, out with friend, some parties. Most importantly, I got to save so much money and lived for free for the duration of that lease. I used that money to hire a small team so I could outsource some of what I did. When the two months until renewal letter came, I told him I'm not renewing and I met someone I didn't. I was just casually using dating apps. He went off on how I'm a terrible person and this and that. But whatever, what was he going to do? I did end up moving out when he was at work, but I wasn't worried that he wasn't going to pay the rent. I'll always find somewhere to live. He couldn't afford an eviction. That's basically it. Now, I have a really nice savings, and I'm looking at buying a house and starting a family next year with my fiancé, who, as ironic and unbelievable as it is, works in a form of finance not trading. He helps with loans and consulting at a bank. Story 3 About a month ago, I received a free bicycle from my cousin. It was an old red beach cruiser of unknown make. I needed a bicycle because my previous one was stolen, and I'm too broke to purchase a new one. My cousin then informed me that he had an old beat-up bicycle in his parents' backyard, and I could have it if I wanted it. When I picked it up, it looked a mess. It was covered in mud, had a rusty chain, nicked paint, and dry cracking on the white sidewalls of the tires. There was even moss on it. Nevertheless, I took it anyway and thanked them. I brought it home, cleaned it up, touched up the paint with nail polish, lubricated the chain with water-displacing spray, put new $7 grips on it, tightened the rear gear, cleaned most of the rust off any chrome, and attached an aluminum kickstand that the bicycle shop had discarded as garbage. It became my daily rider. The tubes and tires were still in good condition, and I got it back on the road for less than $1.10. Honestly, I like it. It rides a little bouncy, but the coaster brake is fun, and it's simple and reliable. The problem arose when my cousin saw me riding it last week and at first didn't recognize it as the same bicycle. It had been so covered in mud previously that he'd thought it was rusted over. Now he claims that I scammed him and demands $1.60 for the bicycle or for me to return it so he can sell it. I've refused, stating that he didn't want it in the first place and I enjoy riding it. He's calling me a jerk and telling his friends and family that I've robbed him. The family is on my side, including his parents. However, his friends think I'm a jerk. But I'm the one who put the work into fixing this bicycle he gave me for free as trash, and I'm the one who actually uses it, unlike my cousin. Update. One of his friends apparently saw my previous post and informed him. Either here or on a podcast or something, I don't know but word spread around. The whole family found out because my cousin ranted to them. Surprisingly, none of them are angry with me. They actually sympathized with me for even feeling like I had to make the post to begin with when my cousin was so clearly in the wrong. My cousin ended up freaking out over it and confronting me on my way home from work. This time he demanded even more money for the bicycle. He said that since I love this social media platform so much, he was taking a jerk tax for humiliating him, and the cost of the bicycle was now $1.80. He ranted about how paying him $80 for the bicycle was the least I could do after I humiliated him. I refused and said that he was acting like a swindler, and the bicycle was hardly worth anything. I put in effort to make it rideable, while he let it rot in his parents' backyard for years. It was junk when I started, and I made it work. Then I listed all the things I did to fix it, and how much it would have cost the bicycle shop to fix it instead. He somehow still did not see my point, and still stated he wanted the money now, or he would be taking the bicycle back whether I liked it or not. I told him I was done with this and tried to ride off. But he grabbed me and pulled both me and the bicycle over before I could ride away. I said, what in the world, man, while I was getting up and then he actually slugged me in the face. It did not break my nose, but really hurt, and it made me bleed. Then he took my bicycle and rode off with it. I am older than my cousin by two years, and taller too. But he is built way sturdier than me since his father is a bit of a husky and strong guy, and he inherited that body type. So he had no problem knocking me down and robbing me. Someone came over to help me up, and then I called the police, 
Family or no family, I was not about to just let him get away with doing that to me, and the altercation happened right in front of a shop with closed-circuit television, which the police later got video from. I got taken to the hospital to have my face checked, and my cousin was arrested by police at his apartment. He had the bicycle there too, and had even already listed it for sale online, but took it down later, thanks to something someone commented on my last post. I documented the serial numbers of the bicycle by photographing them and writing them down at home, so I got my bicycle back from the police without much issue. My cousin tried to tell police the bicycle was still his, but I had texts on my phone from back when he said I could have it, and lots of other text evidence of the harassment that followed. Plus his parents were there when he gave the bicycle to me, and the whole family knew he had tried to swindle me. So he surrendered it, and the bicycle was returned to me at the station. My boss gave me a couple days off work to recover. The injury to my nose was thankfully minor, so I am doing fine. My cousin did not get off easy though. After he was arrested, he was found to have been drinking. So now he has been charged for theft, assault, and underage drinking since he is not 21 yet. He called his parents to come bail him out but they refused after finding out what he did to me. They came to see me after a couple days and were extremely apologetic. They said they had no idea he would do such a mean move to me. They also said he had been asking for money a lot lately and likely was spending that all on his habits. None of us have any idea where he got the alcohol or what kind of long-term punishment he is in for. But I doubt he is going to get off very lightly from this when he goes to court. I did get questioned about whether or not I can press charges, but the police already have the video of the assault and theft, and my cousin is still getting charged for underage drinking, so no one is really asking me to try and speak on his behalf. I do not really want to either. And since I waited a few days longer to post this, my cousin is now out of jail, and his parents have learned from him that he was also behind on rent, and is now facing eviction since his lease was month to month. He was also fired from his job for being a no-show since he was stuck in jail for a few days. One of my friends works in that same place too, and my cousin had already been on thin ice for bad behavior, a lot of tardiness, and repeatedly not showing up for work. So getting arrested was the last straw for his boss, and he was fired. So now he is looking at misdemeanor charges, has no job, and is getting evicted. All because he had to be a jerk and a swindler, from what my parents and his parents tell me, he acted like everything was all my fault. But his parents have shut that down and chewed him out over the fact that he beat me up and stole from me. And this is karma for that. Then they made him promise to leave me alone from here on out. I have heard his parents are not going to be letting him move back into his old room either. Instead they plan on putting him up in the loft above their garage, which is not exactly roomy, as plywood walls and there is no air conditioning up there for the summer heat. I went back to my routine of riding the bicycle to and from work, and I have not been bothered about it anymore by any of my cousin's mean friends. In fact, they seem to have completely distanced themselves from me and anyone else I know, so none of them made any attempt to apologize. But I do not care since I do not really know them. It is just insane that all this was over a used beach cruiser. It is not even an expensive one. I would like to ask my cousin one day if it was worth it, but I do not want to see his face again any time soon. Story 4 This was done by an ex-colleague. Well, this happened a few years ago when I was working as a techno-manager in an Indian startup information technology firm. It was a small firm with less than 50 employees and there were two founders. Let's call them Vicky and Joel. Vicky had worked a short time in a multinational corporation, but was not able to stand authority and had to resign. Whereas Joel had no real workplace experience, Vicky managed the place like a king, showing tantrums, anger, etc. Joel was simply a yes man to Vicky. Now, we had a human resources lady who was okay with the older employees and strict with the newer ones. As for me, I was not that good technically compared to my colleagues, but was good at people management. Also, I was one of the longest serving employees too. I was friendly with most of the employees, especially the new ones. 
This was due to the fact that I knew it was not easy to work with the founders, and I wanted the show to continue as it was my first company too. So, a new joinee named Bob joins, and after six months, he is assigned to a project. Because of the time zone difference, he worked up to 4 5 a.m., and the client was happy with him. Since he was sleeping late, this guy always reported at nearly 11.30 a.m. in the office. Out of the blue, the founder calls me in Human Resources and asks why Bob is late to the office and says he has to be in the office by 10 a.m. like other guys. By the way, I forgot to mention Vicky and Joel came into the office only once in a while, and it was pre-corona times, but since they are founders, let's ignore that. The Human Resources lady took the responsibility of asking Bob about that. At this point, since the human resources lady is not aware of Bob's working hours, I interrupted and told her that he's leaving the office only by 2-4 a.m. and it's kind of unfair to ask him to come early. Vicky cut me off and says, No, he has to follow rules, and this is basic etiquette when working in this office. I said, Okay. The human resources lady calls Bob into her office and questions him about the timings, to which Bob says, Okay, ma'am, we'll comply. Now, Bob and I have a good rapport, and he comes directly to me and tells me what happened with human resources. Then I ask him, What are you going to do? To which he says, I will ask for a clarification via email, and then we'll comply. I understood where it was going and gave him a best of luck, trying hard to contain my laughter. After ten minutes, human resources comes to me with her laptop in panic, and shows me the email which Bob has sent. He has copied the founders, the client head he's reporting to, and has written something along these lines. Hi client head name, this is to inform you that as per a request from my office to comply with office timings, from tomorrow onwards, my work timings would be 10 m Indian Standard Time to 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time, that is, 10.30 p.m. to 7.30 am Chicago time. I request you to change your meeting times to the times when I am available, and if there are any inconveniences, please contact Human Resources, Vicky, or Joel. Thanks, Bob. I asked Human Resources if this was mentioned somewhere in the offer letter, and she nods yes. Then I tell her to take the matter to Vicky. At Vicky's room, since he is the narcissist he is, he scolds Human Resources for not noticing this in the offer letter. Then he asks her to correct this. She goes to Bob and asks for a correction, to which Bob firmly says no. Human Resources, being unwise, tells Bob that she told this because Vicky asked her to, and Bob still stands firm and asks Human Resources if Vicky has said it. Then ask Vicky to formally reply in the email thread asking to revert to his old timings. Bob also says that he is not going to get back to old timings unless Vicky emails and they have approximately four hours to do so before the client reacts. Human Resources comes to me for help, and we go together to Vicky's room and brief him. Vicky lashes out at Human Resources, and at this point I interrupt and say it's better to address the issue as in four hours the client will get involved, and we have to make a decision before that. Vicky hesitantly sends out the email saying it was a mistake as Bob's special case was not considered during the decision-making and Bob can continue his earlier timings. As I walked back to the office, I saw Bob looking at me and laughing really hard, and I had to hold a straight face as the human resources lady was also behind me. Needless to say, Bob has his timings intact. Story 5. I was never popular in high school. In fact, I was the target of constant bullying, especially from my classmates. Being on the chubbier side, I was given the oh-so-creative nickname Fat Ass by my peers. It wasn't pleasant, but I tried not to let it affect me too much. The last time I saw most of my tormentors was during our government-required provincial exam. We were all gathered in the auditorium for this final test, which was taken very seriously. Once the exam started, we weren't allowed to talk, get up, or even look around. Our three principals were there to supervise and enforce these strict rules. Just after the test began, I felt it. A rumbling, gurgling sensation was rapidly moving through my insides. I knew this was going to be bad. I raised my hand, and one of the principals came over. Me, sir, may I please go to the washroom? 
Principal, you should have gone before the exam. No one is allowed to leave. You'll have to hold it. But this was not something that could be contained. I doubted it was even from this world. It was coming, and it would not be ignored. I discreetly looked around at my classmates who had tortured me for years and knew what had to be done. I leaned forward, lifted myself slightly off the chair, and unleashed the biggest, most loaded fart of my life. The sound echoed throughout the entire auditorium, immediately followed by laughter and jeers from my classmates. Classmate 1. Oh my god, fat ass just farted. Classmate 2. Gross, that's disgusting. The principal sprang into action, trying to regain control of the situation. Principal 1. Quiet down, everyone. Get back to your test immediately. Principal 2. This is a serious examination. Stop laughing and focus. And then the smell hit. This had the pungent aroma of seven-day-old Texas road kill left in the sun and marinated in finely aged cream, garnished with straight sewage. The reaction was instantaneous. Classmate 3. Oh, God, what is that smell? Classmate 4. I think I'm going to be sick. Everyone started coughing, hacking, and making disgusted sounds. Some even tried to get up and leave. Classmate 5, my eyes, it burns. Again, the principals tried to maintain order. Principal 3, you can't leave. This is a provincial exam. Sit down and finish the test. I was crying with silent laughter while the principals were desperately opening doors and windows, but it didn't help. Principal 1, this is unacceptable behavior. Whoever did this will face severe consequences. Principal 2, Asterisk, cough, asterisk, asterisk, cough, asterisk, everyone. Please try to focus on your exams. We sat in that foul funk for 15 minutes before it finally dissipated. The entire time, I could hear my classmates complaining and gagging. Classmate 1, I can't believe we have to sit through this. Classmate 2, I can't concentrate with this smell. Classmate 3, this is the worst thing I've ever experienced. Meanwhile, the principals were still trying to air out the room. Principal 1. Asterisk gagging asterisk keep wafting the doors. We need to get this smell out. Principal 2. Asterisk coughing asterisk. This is a disaster. How are we supposed to conduct an exam in these conditions? Principal 3. Asterisk wheezing asterisk just keep fanning. It has to clear out eventually. As the smell finally started to fade. I could see the relief on everyone's faces. My classmates, who had tormented me for years, were now the ones suffering. It was a small victory, but a satisfying one nonetheless. After the exam, I moved away and never saw any of them again. But I'll always remember that day the day I accidentally got my revenge. The image of those principals gagging while frantically waving the doors open and closed will forever be etched in my memory. In the end, it wasn't the nickname Fat Ass that my classmates would remember me by, but as the person who unleashed the most potent, room-clearing fart in the history of our high school, and honestly, I'm okay with that legacy. Story 6 This happened almost 10 years ago while I was contracting for a very large financial services provider. For context, our team manager was promoted to a new division and the team eight of us working across two shifts to cover international hours as well were left with two team leaders. I'll call them Morin Boy and Passivagel to run the operation until the new manager was hired. The new manager joined six months later, or early, depending on perspective, and probably because of me. My job, in a nutshell, was to onboard new employees into all the required systems for their daily functions as well as set up their email and Active Directory accounts for server access. This latter task was dumped on my lap a month into my job because I had prior experience according to Moran Boy. I didn't mind the email and Active Directory work because it took literally two minutes per account and didn't affect my central function by more than 20 minutes a day. Audits were 30 minutes a week. All this happened from a centrally shared mailbox. Being request-based work, you couldn't determine how busy you'd be on any given day. On to the interesting part almost before the door hit the manager on the way out. Morin Boy and Passive Gal called us into a meeting room 
and stated that we must do no less than 10 requests a day, all to be logged on their call logging system. They presented contract amendments we had to sign or be fired. Being a contractor, you'd think I would keep quiet, but I just can't stand being treated unfairly, so I spoke up. I don't see how it's possible to guarantee 80 requests a day minimum for every team member to meet the requirement. Why not scale the ticket count and see who did what? Morinboy's face turned a deeper color, and he shouted at me to mind my own business, saying I didn't know what I was talking about. Cue my malicious compliance, which included calling my contract house manager sassy and funny gal, explaining what was happening. After she could breathe again from laughing so hard, she told me not to get her fired. I headed back to my desk, knowing full well audits were about to start in a week. I received multiple requests to make amendments on accounts to test Active Directory security. And lo, here it begins. I got an email two days later to prep for a massive test. I was tasked to amend nearly 6,000 accounts with new settings, and then change them back on request, with minimal impact to the users during working hours. I needed to do this quickly. Now, any tech worth their salt knows almost anything is scriptable. I set it all up and called my mate at the service desk. Here's the funny thing, he also had a script to log multiple tickets. Roll on D-Day. I took the auditor's call at 8 a.m. to make the change. I sent the email to my service desk mate, and he logged the tickets in a record 30 seconds. My mailbox boomed with 6,000 open tickets. I ran my script, and 90 seconds later, bam, job done. I carried on with my core function. Three hours later, the auditor called me to revert. I ran my second script, everything back to normal, called my mate to close the tickets, and a minute later, my mailbox frazzled for a bit, getting 6,000 closure tickets. At this point, I smiled, sat back, and started browsing all my meme sites, yes, one of the joys of Active Directory control. I gave myself unrestricted internet access, a nice perk. In less than an hour, passive gal came to ask what was happening. I simply stated that the contract amendment they forced on us clearly meant I didn't have to work for 200 days, so I'd be sitting there enjoying my time off, or I could do it from home. Either way, I was ahead of the curve. She walked away, and Moran Boy stormed over, demanding I get back to work. I repeated what I said to passive gal. He spluttered for a while and huffed off. True to my word, I sat at my desk doing nothing. But sadly it didn't last two days before the head of the department called me in. After an initially aggressive start to the meeting on his part, I got to explain the situation. I wasn't even to the good part when he dropped his head into his palm, calmly listened to the story, asked me for a copy of the amendment, and thanked me for my time. Two hours later, he called me back and asked me, with sassy and funny gal in the room, what it would take to get me back to work. I decided to keep it simple, formally retract the problematic amendment, and pay me out for the time spent on the audit, which is 600 days, as per the contract amendment. He puffed up for a few seconds, agreed, and I left for the day. I woke up the next morning to a huge jump in my bank account, with an email confirming I'd be back in the office. Please, I am a man of my word, so I was back at my desk, working as usual. For some reason, moron boy and passive gal never came near me again, even when I shifted to another department.